Hey, what's up? John Sonmez from simpleprogrammer.com. So I got an interview for you all today, and this time I'm interviewing some of the, the two of the founders of, of a company called scaphold.io. And, and I'll be honest with you, I do not know anything <laughs> about <laughs> about what what they're, what they're doing with uh, with GraphQL. So I thought, but but I do know that I have heard this buzzword several times. I haven't had time to to research it myself. So I thought, well, you know what? Hey, let's kill two birds with one stone. I'm kind of interested in this, and I can provide some content for for those of you that are also interested. Especially since you know I've, I've taken a pretty big interest in in VR stuff lately, and I know that this uh, that the graph. QL stuff is being used uh, in in that that domain. So, uh, so welcome, uh, Vince and, and and Michael. Thanks, thanks for being on the show. Hey, thanks, thanks for, for having us. us. Yeah. So, tell me what is what is uh, well, well, tell me your background and and kind of what is this comp this scaffold.io. Sure. So first, it's, it's scaffold. Uh, it's, oh, it's like, a, it's like, a, it's like a, a two F's. Yeah. So the idea of the name was, uh, it's like the foundation for which people build. So we kind of saw it as like the scaffolding of a beautiful, like a building being erected, except like, you know, like you're building apps instead of a building. Oh, okay. That makes a lot more sense. I was wondering what, what a <laughs> yeah, scaffold yeah, the is. The comes from GraphQL. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, well, our background is, you know, we, we graduated college uh, and we built a couple apps and in, 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 while we were in school, we both went to the UVA together. Um, and then after after school, we both went and worked at Microsoft. I worked on SQL Server. Vince worked in the financials platform team. Um, learned a bunch of things, but the whole time we're kind of trying to figure it out. Like, you know, is there something we can start on our own? Um, and then basically, like last March, we applied to the Y Combinator Fellowship Program with this new idea we had been working on, um, which ended up being Scaffold. Um, so essentially, the, the original idea was it was really a platform that we were building for ourselves. So we're app developers. We were kind of frustrated by how long it took to build applications, and also if you're, you know, if you're used to dealing with REST APIs, there's a lot of things to be desired. Um, you know, like you're managing a lot of endpoints, and there's weird SDK problems, and everything's inconsistent. And then we kind of came across this new technology called GraphQL that kind of changed the game. So you can kind of think of GraphQL as like REST 2.0. Okay. So like a lot of people, like a lot of people think it's a database, but it's really not. So all all it is is it's like a transport. It's like it's, they call it an applications layer query language. Is I guess the term they use, um, which you can just think of as they basically it adds a a language to what traditionally you would use REST for. So instead of hitting slash tracks slash you know, 67 to get a sound uh, a song off a of SoundCloud. You now have this language, and you can say, "Give me this," you know, "Give me like like get track," and then it's all typed, and you can basically provide inputs and outputs, and you can you know kind of look at the, uh, you know, the 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 server, look at the data on the server in a much more structured manner than you could with REST. Oh, interesting. So yeah, so this is still happening over HTTP, like you would use yes. REST. So, yeah, I mean. I guess like from a technical standpoint, the way it worked from your client is like there wouldn't be any SDK um, unless you wanted to use some like front end caching library, but it's totally optional. Um, and the language itself is a very declarative language um, in which everything is sent uh, through one post request, uh, you know, HTTP post request to one API. So instead of having like, you know, Michael was saying rest like slash track slash 67 and like a million others, you just have one endpoint uh, where you send everything to, uh, you know, in, in the content body of the payload as strings. So you don't need any SDK. It works for VR apps just the same as it works for iOS apps and web apps. So that's kind of the beauty of it. Yeah, so like it has like the, the origin story really explains why it's good at what it does. So essentially what happened was it was created by Facebook. So it came out of Facebook, like I guess say open source like two years ago. It's been for like five or six years now. So like pretty much all the Facebook mobile apps are powered by GraphQL. Um, and, and what they did was they built it to solve this problem that they had when they, as they were scaling. So Facebook, you know, large, cor like large corporation, they have a lot of different apps on a lot of different form factors. So, you know, they just bought Oculus, so they have VR. Mm -hmm. They have, you know, Facebook, the website, they have their mobile apps, they have their moments app, they have all their like advertising apps. And basically all of those apps need access to the same data and all of that data is stored in like, you know, a hundred different places. So they have a ton of different services running data, like holding their data. They have a ton of different apps trying to consume the data and to get 
like to build a REST API that is both good at reading data from a lot of different places, as well as serving it to a lot of different form factors is really hard. So that's basically like why they built GraphQL was it, it, it serves as like this hub in the wheel that allows you to connect any number of data sources and then it provides a really clean API that you can consume that all of those different data sources through this one API on basically any form factor. Okay, that that's that's starting to make a little bit more sense now because I remember back in the you know when I remember creating APIs, REST based APIs, and we'd you know we'd we'd have an application. A lot of developers I think would build this application, then they build this. REST API layer on top of it, yeah, and then exactly. that's how they get all the, the service-based models. They get all these other applications that talk to that. But then you're maintaining this huge thing, and it's trying to go out to other data sources. And then people are having semantic you know, arguments about whether it should be a get or <laughs> put, yeah, or are exactly. you actually implementing REST correctly? Whereas yeah. now, and, now it's like the pendulum swung the other way, if I understand it. And we're basically like, okay, no, let's just treat this as just one endpoint. Let's just use post and yeah. let's just send a, a structured query language, some kind of that, that we, we have that's standard that we can do Plus more than just yeah. you know, that, that makes sense. So it's, exactly. it's kind of, so if I understand it's embedded a little bit more of the, of the, uh, whereas REST is very open, it's like, okay, how, how do you want to implement your API? Go mm -hmm. for it, where this is more uh, more prescriptive. That's the word I'm looking yeah. for. So I think, I think one of the major benefits of GraphQL that we didn't really focus on earlier is just that it has a type system. And so, you know, with REST, a lot of what you have to do a lot of time is like write your own validation on each endpoint, um, tell it exactly what, you know, data you're giving back. Um, and structure every single time, um, and you get it's, hello. Oh, yeah. Whereas, um, you know, with GraphQL, uh, everything's typed. So, you know, sending data in the server, the GraphQL server will actually give you errors if you, you know, send in the wrong data that it didn't ask for. Um, and also, upon return, you can query for, you know, return fields on the user model that only your client for that particular use case needs. So, like, you don't need for REST, you know. It'll give you back the entire payload every single time um, for any view if you're querying like slash user slash one, two, three. But with GraphQL, you can say like get user, and then I just want the username and the last login, and that's all it'll give you. So essentially, you're sending uh -huh. up this payload that looks like uh, an empty JSON object without the values. It's only the keys. And then what GraphQL does is it abstracts everything where the data, you know, everything from like where the data comes from to like how you process, how you, you know, process the data on the server and serves back the client exactly the JSON object that it asked for with the values filled in. Oh, cool. OK, so no more like parsing the JSON and trying to pull out the pieces that you want. You're getting exactly, yeah, exactly that. Okay. Yeah, there's actually like an additional value add to that as well. So like the type system does a lot in terms of allowing people to build more powerful developer tools. So there's like a lot of there's, you know, in, in GraphQL, if you're familiar with GraphQL, there's the, this, this one tool called graphical. So it's like graph IQL. And mm -hmm. it, it's like an IDE for writing GraphQL queries. And it's awesome. Like it, it gives you uh, like an IDE that gives you autocomplete. You have like introspection. So like your API, you can actually look into it. And you can like, autom like automatically document a, like a, a GraphQL API. Whereas with REST, you know, you're hosting a lot of static pages trying to say like, this is what this endpoint does, this is what this endpoint does. You can actually cook that into the API. And then, the, like, because this type system is there, you can the, the the dev tooling around it makes it so much easier to understand what's going on. And then you'll see like cool projects coming on like iOS. Um, like, there's a a client library called Apollo that on their iOS client they actually are able to at compile time uh, like turn your GraphQL queries into like Swift types at build time. Oh wow! Just because I know the structure of it already, so there's like really cool things. Like there's no more passing JSON back and forth and parsing JSON. Like you can really cook in the the, the type system of the API to the type system of the language that you're coding in. Oh, interesting. So kind of like I don't know if you're familiar with like Xamarin, like mm -hmm, with exactly. Um, with, okay, that that's that's pretty cool. That that would be extremely useful. Then you don't even have to know that. Then it feels like a native API instead of a uh, like one that you have to translate in. And, and right. what you have to do with rest exactly yeah so, yeah so how does it work on the on the implementer side so i mean that makes sense for the con for the consumption of the api all that mm -hmm. sounds great but now i'm thinking in my head 
well, if I want to have a, a GraphQL <laughs> I expose, do I, how do I do this? Like, is there an SDK and I have to hook up all this stuff or is there a simple way to do that on the other side? Sure. So, so the, 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 you know, the standard implementation is the JavaScript library. It's called GraphQL JS and it, it was mm -hmm. built by this guy, Lee Byron at Facebook. Um, so that's like the, you know, probably the easiest way to get started is it'll run in node. And essentially what it does is, so GraphQL itself is a pretty thin wrapper. So, you know, you, you basically create a schema. So you give types and then GraphQL also includes cool things like interfaces and enums and union types and all these things. So you, on, on the server side, you'll build types, you'll define your types, which define your schema. And then you provide these essentially event handlers called resolvers. So and you might say like, okay, I have a type called query that has a field get user. And then you would provide an event handler for get user that might take an ID and that could go talk to any data source. Oh, right? I see. It pulls, okay. the data, it pulls the user and sends the user back down, down the, uh, the pipe. But then it's cool because like you can compound on that. So every type essentially gets its own resolver. So if you imagine like, so it's called GraphQL for a reason. So, you know, it's essentially traversing your graph of data. So it's hierarchical. So it's really good at traversing like these hierarchies of data. So you might have one type that is called like, you know, this is something that we do. So on our service, we'll like allow you to add Stripe, um, like Stripe functionality. And then you can basically like connect Stripe data sources with like the other data on our servers. So you might have like one type called a Stripe charge. And then the resolvers for the Stripe charge know how to talk to Stripe. But then the user has its own resolvers. And then the user type knows how to talk to, you know, SQL. And then in the same query, you might say, okay, give me the user and then also give me the attached like Stripe customer. And then basically the GraphQL runtime is capable of saying, okay, go fetch the user which talks to SQL and then go fetch the Stripe user or the Stripe customer which, which talks to Stripe. And then from the client perspective, it's totally transparent. So it's a really nice way of allowing you to basically modularize your code as well. Okay, okay, I see. So it's just pulling from those mm -hmm. multiple. It's almost like the like a a facade on top of the what's the actually going on, right? Because it's like you're yeah. you're yeah. And there's a lot of like to... libraries. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. It's a, it's a thin wrapper for sure, but the the value add is so apparent that you know a lot of like the weeds underneath are still you still have to handle like you know you still you're still maintaining servers, you're still maintaining databases, all these things, but. Um, GraphQL really just gives you this really nice structure, uh, which allows you to really frame the thinking about how you're going to build your API. Um, yeah. Okay, that's interesting. It reminds me of it, it's funny how the pendulum swings back and forth because it reminds yeah. me I'm thinking of enterprise integration patterns and messaging services and how we did very similar things. But usually in internal, usually that was internal, like when we were creating enterprise tools, is we do we do stuff like that. So now mm -hmm. so actually so one of the problems that that often was encountered in those messaging complex mes messaging architectures was what happens when one of the services goes down? Is there like a a solution in in graph QL that? Yeah, so it's actually not like a fail first model. So like you can have you can have a query that talks to like a hundred different data sources, and if one service goes down, then you get ninety nine results in one error. Oh, okay, okay. Mm -hmm. And on the client side, they would just there would be some kind of protocol for reporting yeah, back. Yeah. The error will probably bubble through. Back the data the comes under a key called data, and the error comes under a key called errors. And it's just okay. the error in the array. Yeah. So you still get the rest of the stuff. You're not waiting for exactly. like you know, forever for yeah. your query to come back. Okay, exactly. that makes a lot of sense. So now tell me on on the on the scaffold side, what what are you what are you doing with GraphQL that makes it easier to use and and consume and yeah. Yeah, so like with GraphQL, you have to define all these types, right? And then you have to like create all these different resolvers um, and write those manually, and then you know host that yourself. Um, so there, it's a it's a pretty like verbose process um, if you think about it. Um, and so you know what we do at Scaffold is you know, we help you set up a GraphQL server. We give you your very own GraphQL server without having to write any code. So as soon as you like you know hit the site, as soon as you go to Scaffold and create an app, uh, we've already deployed a GraphQL server for you. And oh, okay. along with that basic user model with authentication already hooked in, um, and then you know essentially a GraphQL server uh, that has like various APIs already for you that you can you know that you can go access from any application anywhere. So, um, so yeah, so basically it's already deployed. We we give you a self-host, we give you a hosted database, 
um, you know, analytics, uh, good prototyping tools um, to help you launch as fast as possible, and also like these integrations uh, where you can tie in things like Stripe or you know, uh, like things like I don't know, SoundCloud APIs, various APIs that you normally use to be able to grab data from like various parts of the internet, um, and, and basically append modular functionality into your one API. And then in, on top of that, we also provide two other key features, which are one is the real-time support. So we have a good implementation of GraphQL subscriptions using Redis, and it works with you know Apollo client um, and any sort of like WebSocket um, that that you that you might use. So, so you can build apps like you know chat apps. Uh, you can build game apps. You can build dashboarding apps. So it's pretty powerful. So you know not only do we provide like the real-time aspect like Firebase does, but we also provide like the relational tools, like the data modeling tools that Firebase doesn't have, where you can do like joins and connections and things like that, um, all without having to write any code from the server side. Um, and every time you like create a new type, it's already deployed, and your API, uh, you know, adapts uh, to fit your needs. And then the other thing that is really huge is uh, we're able to tie in like custom functionality. So a lot of um, backend platforms traditionally had a lot of trouble with this, um, and and it really makes us feature complete because not only can you do the you know 90 percent of the things you wanted to with crud but you can also um you know tie in your own custom functionality whether it be business logic validation um you know synchronous or asynchronous uh so you can do all of that and it'll hook into your one api and you know everything kind of just everything kind of just fits together whether you're calling data from one service or, or another um and, and or, or you know one integration or another or, or data hosted on scaffolds DB I see okay okay so this sort of solves that problem I was talking about earlier about the the okay now I want to implement this well I, I don't want to spin up right. my own node server and like I'm I'm using a different technology so can you just give me something that uh, yeah okay and, and exactly. what about what about connecting to to let's say I mean for a stripe and stuff that that makes sense right you you can tie in those APIs, but what about like the internal data that I have in my database or in my network? That's you know because I'm assuming that that you're you, I mean you you must be hosting this in the cloud. How are mm -hmm. you connecting in and securely connecting in and getting access to my my internal data within the company or within the app? Yeah, so that's like the, the our newest undertaking is we're building this, we call it logic. And essentially what we're doing is like allowing you to use any kind of microservice provider, something like AWS Lambda or Azure Functions or WebTask, or you can even host it on your own infrastructure if you want, as long as it's internet accessible. Um, we're basically allowing you to tie all of your own business logic hosted on your own servers into what we do. Mm. So, you know, for example, like the classic flow, like I, I, was, I was working on this the other day, is like, Imagine that like someone invited you to join a Slack team. Like you're a new user to Slack and you're being invited for the first time and say you're the one building Slack. Then essentially like like what we're trying to build is allow you to do things like okay, when the user first gets created, the like you need to validate the email, you need to check that the like email has permission to join a team. And then that object needs to get persisted into our database and on the way out it needs to go and maybe like wire up some connections and like include an extra payload from something holding on my like held on my own servers. Like we're basically allowing you to hook into that lifecycle to really pull in functionality from your own servers so that you can really do the business logic that you need for your app. Oh, um, I see. Yeah, yeah, and then more and more, it's something that like will wrap REST APIs. Will you know? It's 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 growing in breadth a lot, um, so that you'll be able to connect more and more. Um, and like enterprise customers, like they could have their own, like they could run it behind their own firewall if they wanted. Okay, okay, it's it's starting to make more sense to me now. Okay, that 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 clears things up. So now, what what about your your guys' story on? It, it's kind of interesting. I think that you know to to leave Microsoft, <laughs> a lot of people, <laughs> you know, uh, it's a pretty it's a pretty cush job if you if you get in there and you can you know yeah. you can. A lot of <laughs> people are are what I call lifers there <laughs> so so what made you to, you know to go out and take this risk and go out on your own and, and and do this and and you know decide to you know not not pursue the corporate world it was really YC I mean we were kind of YC fanboys and uh, mm -hmm. all through college we were like you know it was, it was kind of funny like we you know through college like I found well hey we found GraphQL on Hacker News so like yep. 
we, we were reading Hacker News and then we came across this GraphQL thing and I remember just being like, holy, like, you know, this changes the game, let's go do this thing. And then like two months <laughs> later, it ended up being uh, something that YC was interested in. Um, but it was really something like through school, like was really interested in YC, like always had like the entrepreneurial spirit. Vince and I like started, a, you know, I, I, I dare call it a startup, but it was a fun music, like, you know, it was a music startup in college that ended up not really going yeah. too far, but it was really fun to work on and kind of always, like always had the itch to do something entrepreneurial. And I just remember like when we first got our jobs at Microsoft, we were kind of thinking like, <laughs> all right, what, like, what can we do? Like, what's the yeah. thing that we do to let us quit? Like, let's go figure out something to build. Um, so it's kind of always, and you know, we were young and it was, it was just a passion of ours. So it, it wasn't too hard a decision. Our parents, yeah. I think were the most the most concerned about yeah, it. Absolutely. Um, yeah. And then we got into the fellowship program and yeah. that was kind of the catalyst to which like we, yeah. we jumped off the Microsoft ship and hopped on board here. Yeah. We went through the YC interview and they were like, so why haven't you quit yet? Yeah. That was <laughs> just, the question. Like, we never really talked about it. Explicitly. We just like looked at each other and both just tacitly agreed that we were just going to turn in our two week notice the next day. <laughs> oh, wow. Okay. So, yeah. so the, so how did that go? How was the interview process with, with YC then? Like, did it was, you, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, they, they, it's, it's, it's contrary to what you think. Like, although they, they, they invest a lot of time and money into you, it's only a 10 minute interview. So they fly wow. you down just for 10 minutes uh, of their time, of your time. And, and essentially like there's a, like two, three, maybe four partners that sit in on your 10 minute interview and it's just you and your co-founders. Um, and then they just, they, they kind of pepper you with questions. Um, and I think depending on like how they feel you are as like a person, as a founder, or like how robust your idea is um, in various areas of the business, um, they'll drill into that aspect and then make sure you like are able to like hold your ground essentially. Um, and, and, you know, kind of answer the questions that they thought they think, you know, could turn into something great. Cause like, obviously at the time when we applied, we were like, we had just built this in the evenings and it was very much a prototype. Like, I mean, it was a high fidelity prototype, but it was still a prototype. We had one user who was like our friend <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> who happened to be building it out at the same time. So thank God for him. I mean, he just, he, he kind of just like wrestled through all of our bugs essentially, <laughs> um, at the time. And, and so we walked in with one user. And so there was no traction, and, and I think they say traction trumps all, and we had just about zero traction. Um, but what they did was they asked us like about the technology, about us as founders, how we work together, and then like sometimes they even have a person just observing your interactions in the room as, as, as two co-founders. Um, so yeah, so, so there's a lot that goes in than just like you know, the idea and like how much traction you have or how much money you've made. It's because it's so early, like anything goes and they know your idea can change over time. So they, they really just try to like see if you're good people to do this, like what your backgrounds are, um, you know, like how, how, how you're able to implement this and execute it. Okay. Okay. That's, that's interesting. And, and, and in a very short amount of time. <laughs> yeah, they can decide. I think they've just seen so many companies walk through the door that like they just, they just have a sense for it. Yeah. So you must have been, you guys must have been pretty dang excited when you heard that you got accepted, huh? Yeah. <laughs> it was awesome. Yeah. I mean, like it, we, it was it, originally we got accepted into the fellowship program, um, mm -hmm. which was kind of like, I kind of think of it as, as like the YC JV program. Um, cause we, that, that we were actually able to do remotely and we actually worked out of our house in Seattle. Um, and then it wasn't until after that, so that's a, it's a two month program that ended in July. And then right after that, we got to interviewing again. Um, and then we actually got accepted into the, the real YC program, which we started about two weeks ago down in Mountain View. So that's what we're doing now. Oh, wow. Okay. So you're actually in it right now. I didn't even realize yeah. that. Yep. We live in a house with uh, like, two other companies. Yeah. Like <laughs> six founders. <laughs> okay. Okay. And yeah. so now, now what about money? <laughs> Did you save up money? Do you have, uh, you know, how do you, how are you going to live? That's another nice thing about Microsoft, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Provide us a nice little like uh, cushion for a few months. Yeah. Um, no, YC does give a, a little yeah. investment as well. So um, you know, like for us, it's super valuable because you also get a, like a, an amount of cloud credits and a lot of our costs have to go to cloud infrastructure because we run a lot of infrastructure. Yeah. Right. Um, so that was really nice. And then other than that, there was a, yeah, yeah. An, an investment that we were, that we received. Okay. Okay. And are you guys going to be doing fundraising as well? Like, have you, have you looked into that yet? Or are you not at that stage yet or? Yeah, so I think that's the goal um, in like the coming couple months. Right now, basically, like YC gave us 
good chunk of money to go like build our product and like get users and make sure that like everything flies and we get a lot of traction. Um, and so, you know, right now we're just kind of focused on that. And then I guess like uh, up until like, you know, March or April or something like that, we really don't have to think about money um, because, you know, YC kind of provided us this nice little springboard to, to, you know, launch our app and get as much traction as possible. Okay. That's cool. Yeah. That, that helps a lot. I, it's, I've, I'm on, I'm a tech uh, advisor on a, on a small company and the, the founder, he, mm -hmm. um, he, he just spends so much, it's such a, you know, he's either in like fundraising mode or, or oh, yeah. CEO mode and it's such a <laughs> difficult thing. So it's nice to have a little bit of runway so you don't have to immediately jump into fundraising mode. Yeah. Yeah. Work on the technology. So, yeah. Cool. Well, uh, you know, I, I, I hope you guys do well. I'm, I'm excited for you. Sounds like a great, a great uh, opportunity. And, and you've got a, a great idea here with, uh, with something that has a lot of traction. And, and thanks for educating me. I, I, I <laughs> should have known a little bit more about GraphQL, but I just haven't had the, the time to research. I haven't had to build anything in, in a while. So um, I, f I feel like uh, this, this was beneficial. Hopefully this will be beneficial to, uh, to those that are, are watching this or, or listening to the podcast as well because uh, it sounds like pretty interesting technology and sounds like you guys have, have are going to make it a lot easier for, for someone to implement and start using. So uh, that's yeah. And, cool. and if people are looking for resources, we actually just put up like a community page about two weeks ago where we aggregate a bunch of GraphQL code examples, boilerplates, projects, uh, learning guides, Q and a on one page. So if you want to go, it's scaffold.io slash community. Um, that okay. is a good place to start to get all your learning guides that you possibly need for GraphQL. Um, and if you're getting started, whether you're getting started or you just need help as you're implementing it, as you're going along. Cool. Well, I appreciate that. All yeah. right. Well, go Absolutely. check it out. Mm -hmm. and, uh, yeah. Thanks guys. Uh, and uh, mm -hmm. hopefully I'll, I'll talk to you in the future and see, uh, see uh, the success you're having. So thanks. thanks. Yeah. Right. Take care. Talking to you.